Good morning and welcome to the Christian Gospel Fellowship. Today is May 17th, 2020, and we're still continuing to meet uh, via the internet as we worship together uh, through our YouTube channel and the, uh, the posting of that on Facebook. We do have the service available on our website as well, which is www.thechristiangospelfellowship.com. I know that's a bit wordy, but if you can check it out, there's also great scripture resources our church constitution, and a bunch more information about our church. We miss you all. We can't wait to be together with you again. But in the meantime, we ask that you prayerfully uh, consider the ways that you can care for one another. Uh, At the same time, we also have one quick announcement, which is we want to encourage you that if you have not already given, but you would like to give uh, your tithes and offerings, you may do so by mailing those to the church or contacting one of the elders and deacons Uh, with your offering, and we'd be happy to help get those to Penny Rischel, our treasurer, uh, to do God's work with those funds. Uh, Apart from that, please continue to pray for our missionaries, for uh, the world as we continue to struggle together, uh, and may we continue uh, to uh, faithfully love one another, that we would have no division and no challenges between us uh, as we long to get together again. Help us to make the right decision, Lord, Uh, as we look to gather again. And I pray that you would ask that prayer of the Lord as well. Thanks so much, and I can't wait to see you again soon. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things, so that our joy may be complete. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to be in your word and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Guide our hearts as we worship you in music. And uh, thank you for the service of Sean and Kaylee, for Bob and for Kathy, Ariana and McKenna, as they've been faithful to come in and record during this COVID-19 craziness. God, we thank you for how you provide for us and take care of us. Help us to enjoy this time in worship. Amen.
Good morning. This morning we're going to start a new series. We're calling it the promises from the letters of John. The message is entitled this morning, Real Relationships Rejoice. Sounds kind of silly, but I think you'll get the point once we get into the message. The author of these three epistles, along with the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation, is none other than the Apostle John. All of John's writings have been written with a specific purpose. In the Gospel of John, he centers his writings on presenting Jesus as the God-man. The key verse in, John, in the Gospel of John is John 20, verse 31. It says the Gospel was written that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. In Revelation, he reveals Jesus as the righteous ruler who will return as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Well, this series is centered around his letters. And these three letters present Jesus as the real God, the genuine God who promises life and light and love. And though he was by now an old man, and I mean old in his late 80s, age had not hindered John's fiery zeal for the truth. We live in a day and age where truth seems to be irrelevant. It, there isn't a whole lot of truth, though, today. We get very discouraged with that. Recognizing the dangers and threatening the church, the apostle took up his pen to defend the faith. And in our inclusive age of secularism, postmodern relativism, new age cults, militant world religions, and now with a worldwide pandemic, the apostle's words of warning and assurance are both timely and relevant. It was important to the Apostle John for people to be sure about who Jesus really is. By the end of his life, the church has taken in all kinds of new beliefs and religions. It became very inclusive John's common phrase throughout his letters is that you may know. And the most important thing that you need to know this morning 
is to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. We're living in times, in times where society is quite corrupt and even chaotic. Falsehood is rampant. I mean, you, we don't even want to watch television anymore. This pandemic has changed everyone's lives. Many people are confused about about what true Christianity looks like, and, and their understanding is only defined by what the world tells them through social media. Huh. Hope seems to be lost today, and, and people are looking for, they're looking for hope in all the wrong places. And the Lord's laid it on my heart to get into this series, this series of hope. And what better hope can we than we have, but drawing it from the promises of God. We need to get back to what is genuine, what is real, which is the triune God of Genesis 1-1. We need to get back to what is authentic, which is the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, Hebrews 12-2. And instead of, of, of being hopped up with emotionalism, we need to have a real encounter with the Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, I thank you for the word. I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will take over and minister to hearts that are listening. We know, Father, that this uh, pandemic is really um, doing a number on people. But God, we know that you are in control. And Lord, as we uh, are reminded this morning, and we pray that it will be an encouragement, that there are things that you promise and God, we know that you will never lie and that our hope will be in you and that we will be encouraged and renewed in our found faith. And Father, for maybe some that may be listening this morning, maybe they're just listening and they're not quite sure about who you are, Jesus. I pray that you will work in a special way through the word and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what promises can we draw from 1 John 1, 1 through 4? Well, the first thing that we can see there, it stands right out, is the promise about life. The first thing that we need to know is that there's, there's a big difference between existing and living. There's a big difference between surviving and thriving. And it all hinges on whether or not you have genuine life. I'm not talking about just life. I'm talking about real life, genuine, genuine life. Jesus Christ didn't leave heaven to come to earth, to hang on a cross, die for our sins, and go to hell and back so that we could stumble through life trying to find meaning in our existence and making a mark in this world before we leave. He came that we might have life, John 10, 10 says, genuine life, and to have it more abundantly. My question is, do you know if you have the life Jesus is offering? Is it an ordinary life, or is it abundant life? I want to show you from verses 1 through 4 in 1 John, I want to show you four things that Jesus promises to the life of the believer. The first thing that we find is in verse 1. He promises that he, Jesus, is the word of life. Listen to what it says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Keep in mind that John was writing to the church at large. In essence, all believers... So he's writing to you and to me if you know Christ as your Savior. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, he's writing to you you also. He immediately speaks of the eternal nature of Christ. He urges them to consider the source of their faith. The principal element of Christianity is the Word. This should come as no surprise. John began his gospel account of our Lord in the same manner. In the Gospel of John, verses 
1 and 2, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. The early believers were under intense persecution. And wanted the, he wanted them to take comfort in the fact that their faith in Christ was not some new founded religion. Of all the religions that were creeping into the church, it wasn't something that sprang up from a group of crazy group of crazies at Pentecost. They were actually trusting in the eternal God, the sovereign of the ages. You see, in 1 John 1, 1, there's a capital W in word. And it denotes the part of the Godhead. In this, this case, the word is Jesus, the Son of God. And understand, he is real and not make-believe. You see, John's making that point to these believers. He is God. He is deity. He is not an illusion. He's not a dream. He is the incarnate God and not an idol. He is a person and not an idea or a philosophy. Believer, you need to realize that you're not chasing the wind or buying into some far-fetched fairy tale. If you're saved, it's because you have put your faith in Jesus, the great I am, who was, is, and is to come. And believe me, Jesus is the real deal. John says that which was from the beginning. There are three beginnings mentioned in the Bible. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This is the beginning of the material world. In the Gospel of John, John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was made, was, was with God, and, and the Word, listen, the Word was God. This is the beginning of the Word. Some try to preach John 1, 1 and 2, and make reference to the Word as being the Bible. The Bible is the Word. It's the written Word. It's stated that the Bible is the word of truth in John 17, 17. But here in John 1, Jesus is the word of life. Verse 14 makes that very clear. In, in John 1, 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God's word is important. God shows us his word. The first thing that I want to uh, share with you about the word is, is we need to look at, 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 we see the substance of the word. The substance is Jesus. Without Christ, there is no Christianity. Without Christ, there are no Christians. He is the object of our attention. He is the center of our affections. He is the agent of our redemption. Also, we see the stability here. Look how John's description of Jesus intensifies. He says, we heard him. We see him with our eyes. We have looked upon him. Our hands have handled him. The word look there means to gaze intently. It is to examine. It's to scrutinize. They studied Jesus Christ for three and a half years. I want to tell you, if there was any, anything questionable about him, they would have known it. They were very close to him, especially John, was in the inner circle. Thirdly, we see the surety. This is the same John that put down his nets and followed Jesus. He was an eyewitness to the life and ministry and miracles of the Lord. He had sat at his feet. And heard his wisdom. His eyes had beheld the miracles he performed. John was there as Jesus died upon the cross. Watching him take his last breath. And he entered the tomb finding it empty. He was among those who witnessed the Lord after the resurrection. Receiving instruction to continue in the faith. And the furtherance of the gospel. He ate with Jesus on the shore of Galilee. In his resurrected state. 
Peter, too, was an eyewitness of the testimony. In 2 Peter 1, 16, he had, you know, these guys had, had not been part of something carnal. They witnessed the glorious mystery of God himself. We have never seen the Lord with our eyes. At least I haven't. I've had people say they have. In my 40 years of knowing Christ, I, I'm not sure about that. But we all have encountered his glory and power. And you think about that. After 30, 40 years of ministry, I said 30, actually it's 40. I've witnessed God transform. I, I witnessed him transform too many lives to doubt who he is. I know that what he has done for me and you'll never convince me that my Lord is not alive and well. The world may doubt and they may scoff, but we have undeniable, irrefutable proof that our Lord lives and has power to change lives. John knew that. He knew that Jesus was the word of life and he made it very clear right from the get-go in his letter to whoever would listen. You may be uncertain about all that I just told you. But I'll tell you that today you can experience the same thing that John did. You can see Jesus through the window of faith. You can hear Jesus through the sound of faith. You can touch Jesus through the feelings of faith. You can know him personally with the heart of faith. The promise is the word. Secondly, he promises he is the gift of life. Here we see the presentation of the word. In verse 2, it says, 1 John 1, it says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show it unto, unto you, that eternal life which was from the Father and was manifested in us, unto us. For something to be a gift it has to be free. For a gift to be, to be good, it has to be practical so that we can use it. For a gift to be great, it has to be personal and given in love. For a gift to be glorious, it has to be powerful enough to change your whole life. The most glorious gift ever given was Jesus Christ, the gift of God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In 1 John 1, verse 2, he says that he was manifested. The word was manifested. That means revealed. It means obvious. It means he was made known. God's great gift was not hidden. People don't have to go around trying to Look for clues to see if they can find Jesus. God reveals himself. He has done it from the beginning. He uses nature. He uses his word. And when you look to him, he'll show you himself. I want to look, first of all, here at the promise of the word being the gift of life. I want to look at some of the things about this gift of life. First of all, who qualifies for the gift of life? In order, in order to be found, you must realize that you're lost. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. When you realize that you're a sinner, you're separated from a holy God, you realize, as Adam and Eve, that you were cast into a state of lostness because of our sin, the sin we inherited from Adam. And we need to be rescued. Romans 10, 9 says, if you, can, if, if, you can, if, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. Verse 
13 says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, I found it interesting. I have Bob do a, a bulletin every week. Hopefully we'll be getting back together soon. But his, in his bulletin, he, he, he always gives a, uh, a think about that thought. And his think about thought was on lost and found. Go figure. It fits right in with what I was saying. It says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. In America, it's called lost and found. In Great Britain, lost property. In Canada, lost articles. More than just a phrase. These are usually designated places in a facility or a building where lost articles are collected and can be retrieved. Okay, so anyway, down at the end, it says some people lost and found might also be appropriate way to describe the theme of the Bible. Ever since Adam and Eve were evicted from the Garden of Eden, humanity has been lost. Thankfully, as soon as the predicament of lostness was realized, God put into place a means of finding lost humanity and reconciling them to himself. He sent Jesus Christ to the world to seek and to save that which was lost. Some people today feel lost, but don't know why. Others don't believe that they are lost at all. The church's mission is to declare not only man's lost condition, but also God's rescue mission to find us and bring us home. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. John Newton, Amazing Grace. Go figure that Bob would put that in the bulletin for the day. Very appropriate as we look at the qualification. Not only do we see the qualification of this gift, but we see the quantity of this gift. He says in 1 John 1, 2 that it's eternal. Eternal. There's no beginning and no end. Eternity enters, it entered into time when God stepped on earth in the incarnate Jesus Christ. And when a person receives Jesus as their Savior, eternity steps into your heart. At that very moment, you receive eternal life. You're filled and sealed with the Holy Ghost, rescued from hell and bound for heaven. John 5, 24 says that when you believe, you pass from spiritual death to eternal life. I don't know about you, but that ought to get us jumping to our feet and rejoicing with joy of what we have in Jesus Christ. Last of all, I want to look at the quality that this gift brings. When you receive this gift, this gift is abundant, abounding, abiding life that comes from God. And that we receive it from Jesus Christ. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him to, receive him, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe in his name. We receive all of his riches and glory the very moment we receive him as Savior. Friend, God's too big for us to hide him. His grace and his mercy is too sweet not to share in his gift of life, a gift of life like this, it's too, it's too good to keep to ourselves. John said, we have seen it, we bear witness, and we show it on, unto you that eternal life which the Father showed us. Like John, we need to, to make sure that we're showing that manifested life to others also. From the time I became a Christian, I have been telling people about the gift of life they can have eternally with Jesus because it's the greatest gift you could ever give to someone to change their life. Thirdly, Jesus promises that he is fellowship. He is the fellowship of life in verse 3. I call that the proclamation of the word. Let me ask you a question. Are you suffering from loneliness? I don't know about you, but this pandemic, when I call people, they talk to me for a long time. And I'm glad because I miss you. 
Fellowship is the answer to, to loneliness. And this pandemic has really put a hamper on, on our fellowship, huh? But that's going to change. Lord willing, we'll be back together soon. This is what we need to consider concerning the proclamation of the word of life regarding fellowship. A personal obligation, fellowship with the family. Verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. John said that you might have fellowship with us. He says that we may have fellowship together. Fellowship means commonality. The fact is that man is born a sinner, and a sinner doesn't have anything in common with a holy, righteous God. But God, in his unchanging, his undeniable, unconditional love, wants to have fellowship with sinful man. That could only happen through somebody who could be both God and man. So, through his grace, God sent his son Jesus, who though he was a full he was fully God, took upon himself a human body, and became a man. Then he went to the cross and he took upon that body the sins of the world. And through his blood, the price was paid in full for our sins. And that brings us to, to the fellowship of life. You see, being right with Jesus shows up in the way that we treat others. Not only in, but also outside of the church. You see, I can't be wrong with you and right with God. That's the one thing that happens to a Christian. You see, when, we're, when I'm wrong with you and right with God, I have broke my fellowship. I broke my fellowship with you. I broke my fellowship with God. Everybody has different likes and dislikes. Not everybody listens. Not everybody listening here is the, of the same gender, the same generation, the same, or, or grew up the same way. You know, I might not eat my eggs the way you eat your eggs. We're not to be cloned. The world looks at Christians and says, oh, you're just cloned, you're just sheep. But we are to have some common, some things in common. We're not looking for uniformity, but there should be unity. Believer, if you have been born again, you will have the likeness of Jesus Christ. If you believe the Bible and all that it states about creation, the virgin birth, Jesus' sinless life, his pure sacrificial death, Jesus being the only Savior, and his second coming, then we have some things in common and are obligated to fellowship because we're part of the family. We also need to consider a practical expectation, fellowship with the Father. Verse 3 goes on and says, Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. The only way we can have fellowship with God the Father is by trusting his son for salvation. When you do that, you are brought into the fellowship of life with the Father and with the Son. And that happens through the Holy Spirit. That becomes the life of Christian fellowship. That is the life expected of the believer. John had one desire, and that was to tell others about Christ. He knew what had happened to him, and he was convinced that Christ had the power to transform any life as well. He fully expected them to experience the wonder of salvation and then the gift of fellowship. Once a person experiences this promise of genuine life, there will be a natural tendency to start sharing it with others and being around people just like them. You know the old saying, birds of a feather flock together. And as Christians, we are to soar above all the differences and be able to nest together in a unity of Christian fellowship. Jesus brings unity through the gift of fellowship with God and with one another. 
the church. Lack of fellowship hurts, doesn't it? This pandemic has put a, has put a hamper on our fellowship. And don't worry, we're going to get together again. And we're going to get together soon. Amen? Well, Jesus, he starts off in these writings of John by giving his promises. He promised that he was the word of life. Jesus promises that he's the gift of life. Jesus promises also that he's the fellowship of life. And last of all, in verse 4, Jesus promises that he's the joy of life. I call that the persuasion of the word. Why did I call it that? Listen to what John says. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. Fellowship is Christ's answer to loneliness. Loneliness in life. But joy is the answer to emptiness and hollowness of life. Do you feel empty? Do you feel that your life is hollow? You see, you can't be empty of Jesus and full of joy. John uses the word joy just once in his epistle. But the idea of joy, it runs throughout the entire letter. Joy is not something that we can manufacture like, like um, ventilators or mass. Joy is not fun. Fun is here today and gone tomorrow. Joy is not happiness. Happiness is dependent on our circumstances or, or, or what happens to us or what makes us happy. Joy is the experience. It's only experienced by having an intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ. John wanted them to experience the same joy he had. He knew what it was to experience the fullness of joy. And he realized that life was lacking without it. The, full, the word full means to abound, to be complete. There was absolutely no reason for the believers to be lacking when it comes to joy. You know, there is no reason for you as a believer to be lacking when it comes to joy. I believe we, are allowed, we, we allow fear and we allow doubt to rob us of the victory and joy that God has for us. We ought to serve the Lord with confident expectation. If Jesus can save me and you, he can save anybody. If John could enjoy his presence and fellowship, we can too. If the early church experienced his power in great and mighty ways, we ought to expect the same. Our Lord is more than able to meet our needs and the needs of others, whatever they may be. Remember I told you John in his gospel, at the end of his gospel, he said in John 20, 31, these things we write to you that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you will have life in his name. The key to fullness is, is joy. The, the, the key to fullness of joy is revealed in our fellowship with believers. There is an obligation, but most importantly, fellowship with the Father that is expected. That is what eludes so many in our day. Churches are filled with Christians who live defeated lives, void of joy. So how does one possess fullness of joy? This is certainly not an exhaustive list, but I can assure you, if these are present in our lives, and there's just a few that I can mention here this morning, we know that we have to have fellowship with one another and with God. That's a given. But that fellowship is obtained through prayer. The scripture says in Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for nothing, 
But in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says pray without ceasing. So prayer is an element for joy. Bible study also is another element, another, another um, quality that we have available to us. Joshua 1.8 said that we are to meditate on the word day and night, that it shouldn't leave our lips. Spending time in the word is immeasurable. Prayer in the Bible study, what it does is it gives us fellowship. And when you're home in this pandemic, you can study the word and you can call your brothers and sisters and have fellowship with them over the word of God. And through it, Jesus promises the joy of life. Do you realize that we hold in our hands the written record of a man who walked and talked and ate with Jesus? John was one of the inner circle. He was one closest to Jesus. It is impossible for us to understand all John had hidden in his heart, although he revealed it through his writings, a glimpse of it anyway. He had enjoyed the very presence of Christ. He knew the Lord in an intimate way, and it had drastically, eternally changed his life. John was filled with the abundant joy, and he wanted the world to experience that same kind of joy as well. He was simply sharing his personal encounter with Lord in his writings. We should feel the same obligation. You might argue that your life doesn't compare with the experiences of John. I mean, we weren't eyewitnesses with him, with the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe that anyone who has met the Lord in salvation has something wonderful and worthwhile to share. Has Christ not changed our lives? Have you not experienced a wonderful, a fulfilling transformation? How can we experience such wonder like that and keep it quiet? Psalm 1611 says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Joy is not a byproduct of pleasure or position, or power, but rather life, a life centered on Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, the Apostle Paul wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Paul didn't write this letter surrounded by all his friends, at a rally, at a revival meeting. Paul wrote this from a dingy, dark prison cell. How could he rejoice? How could he experience the joy? Here's what I want to ask you this morning. Do you want to go through life with money problems, marriage problems, midlife crisis, pandemics, like we're experiencing now, and a messed up society? Do you want to go through life with the joy of the Lord? Or do you want to go through through it moping and moaning and mourning, just like the rest of the world. Which do you prefer? Some folks have no idea how to go through circumstances joyfully. John did. You know what he did? He shares it with us in his letters. He relies on the promises of God. Father in heaven, I thank you for the word. I thank you for each one listening today. And Father, as we jumpstart this series on the promises from the letters of John, I pray that God, that you will work in hearts this morning. And Father, if there's one there this morning that may be listening, that may not be sure of their relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe this morning the Holy Spirit is tugging on their heart and saying, you are lost, you're a sinner. Your sin deserves to be punished. Jesus loves you and came to this world and died on the cross to take your place, to pay for your sins so you could have fellowship with him and with the Father. And with whoever believes in him, 
a wonderful fellowship. And God promises that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you could be saved. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is that the prayer of your heart this morning? If it is, I want to welcome you into the kingdom of God, into a fellowship with the Father and with the family of God. We don't deserve to be the family of God. But because of God's grace, he came to earth and changed all of that. Our relationship, the sin that separated us from God, and God changed it all. And the joy that you receive when you receive Jesus, you just have to do it to understand it. I trust that God has worked in your heart. And for you that know Christ as Savior, I trust that you will rely on the promises of God the way John did so that we can be that witness, so that we can be that testimony, so that we won't be discouraged. There are thousands of promises in the Bible. And as we look through the letter of John, we're going to draw out some of those promises. Thank you. In Jesus' name.